boots around at the moment in sort of shiny brown and red and colours like that with big thick square heels. The jacket is a real find, isn't it? It is. I mean, it's all wool. It's got bell-bottom sleeves, if you like. So you can wear them down if your wrists are getting a bit chilly. Yeah, in the winter. So that's, that's, you put all that together in one morning. Now, yeah. you're at Camden Market here in London, but I guess that there are some other much cheaper places around even than Camden Market. Definitely. I mean, London, it's touristy, so it's expensive. If you go around the British Isles, then you get, you know, much better bargains. My money would have gone a lot further. Plus, I could have gone to charity shops, jumble sales, and got a whole selection of things, really. What are the sort of things that you should look for? Um, well, you can have a look at, check for seams that are splitting and fraying, because if you see something really fabulous, if it's falling apart, then don't buy it, basically. Also, sort of sweat stains and patches of dirt and things that look like they won't be able to be removed. So, that. Something that I've noticed in some second-hand clothes is a little CC mark. It's like two black Cs, and sometimes there's a, a number, like a 41 or a 42, and that, those were clothes that were made during the war, and they were brilliantly made. They were made with very, very sturdy last. material, and they're often a good bargain as well to buy. I know about that one. Yeah. But a lot of people are interested in buying trendy clothes with labels on. Now, that doesn't really match up with the whole second-hand clothes ideal, does no. it? No. I mean, a lot of people are real, like, label snobs, and they want to buy by something fashionable but I mean it's silly really you shouldn't be snobby about clothes you know you can go out and get really good second-hand things and sometimes you can find some old designer bargains and I mean you know just be a fashion victim and these are from oh, a second-hand shop they're gorgeous Charlie just your size ah. <laughs> I couldn't get any more good old Gordon. 70s they're brand Red new. Hills. They've never been worn. Carmela would like these, actually. I thought they just. <laughs> no, she wouldn't. She's saying. No, she prefers the um, the black patent boots, really. And these are wonderful. These. Are these very expensive. These... No, no. These are really cheap. Oh these are actually. These were brown tortoise shell, and I painted them black to go with the outfit. Oh, absolutely terrific. Those, those are from are. the second-hand shop. But you're talking about the whole sort of recycling aspect of second-hand yeah, clothes. Yeah, it's a green what, issue now. When you're taking your clothes in, if you're going to take old clothes in, and say you live around the Bristol West Country area, I know that the Cancer Research Campaign, together with Bristol Poly, are running a scheme whereby if you take your clothes into the Cancer Research Campaign around that part of the country, the students at Bristol Poly are going to put on a fashion show yeah. and raising money. Well, that's Isn't that good brilliant? Idea. What Definitely. a good idea that is. So always, if you're going to a charity shop, take along some old second-hand clothes as well. Recycle it. Keep the whole chain going. Keep it going. Charlie, thanks very much for coming in that's today. Okay. We've got a real treat on our hands now. Well, it is for us, but not for Gordon. <laughs> Philip, I think I've got to hand over to you. Stop! For go Come in here. It's a nightmare. It's a night. Just stop! Everybody has to do it at some stage, Gordon. It has to be done. Oh. Listen, 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 listen. Just calm down a second now. I knew, I knew, that it's your fault, basically, it's your fault because you've encouraged this. Thank you very much indeed for sending all the stuff in to Gordon here. If we look along here, we can see all his various accoutrements that have been, thanks very much for all these. Uh, there's, um, there's a, uh, a little tiny thing of bath soaps here. There's also um, some little <laughs> bits and pieces of lavender water, a foaming bath gel, Gordon's bath salts. Oh, I've oh, jumped in the bath. There's Gordon's bath salts there. There's a little boat. The little boat. Gordon, stop! You have to have it done. So, it's got. It's got to be. It's got to be done. <laughs> Oh, look, I knew that this, look, there's a hair, stop it! There's a hairdryer here as well, look. A little hairdryer, little hairdryer. And if you look down the front of the bath, just look down here, underneath my card, this is terrific. We're going through as many as we can because, of course, it's not possible to mention everybody. This is his little bath mat. This looks like one of your cousins. <laughs> there's his little bath mat there, and all this bit, and uh, who sent that in? Who sent the potty? He is trained. And down by the side here, we've got an odour-proof peg. Thank you for that. Little odour-proof peg here. Let's get that hanging on there. This has come from... Um, it's come... Oh, it's got foam all over it. From Ben Jones. Thank you, Ben, for that. That's excellent. There's also some... Uh, there's a little shampoo here, Gordon. I didn't know you had dandruff. It doesn't, he says. Down here. Look. Little cap. 
one of those there. That's come from Sarah, <laughs> Sarah and Lucy. There's no need for any of this, Gordon. This is once a year. If you're wondering what's going on and you're wondering why this is all happening, gophers only have a bath once a year. This is Gordon's bath time. Um, we decided that it had to happen on, basically you decided it had to happen on television because of the amount of stuff you've sent in. Soaps and brushes and bags and bits and pieces. And I think, Gordon, it's about time you had the shower now. I think the shower's next. Do you want to put your cap on? Look, I've got, I've got, I've got to switch it on myself here. All right, you ready? Here it comes. Here it comes. <laughs> Ooh, there's an air of tension now. Here's it. The, the shower's not working. <laughs> it's not working. The shower's not working. Oh, that's a shame. I think you've escaped that one, actually. You've, oh, here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. Just little bits and pieces. Oh, you've escaped the shower, Gordon. There's no doubt about it. That is not going to work properly. Well, I'll have to, get, have to get that working at some stage. It's a little bit like mine, as a matter of fact. Give it a bit of a tap. I think there's a bit of dirt up there. The problem with London water, of course, is that you get a bit of lime scale. Ah, here it comes. You get a bit of lime scale occasionally. We have very hard water here. <laughs> well, Gordon, there you go. The annual bath is completed and done. And you want to towel yourself down now. And this, you're not supposed to wear a life jacket. I'll dry you off. There you are. How do you want your hair? Because, of course, once he's done his hair, he can't do a thing with it. Can't do a single thing with his hair. It's all over the place. There we are. That's enough. There you go. That's done. It's all over. It's finished. Thank you very much indeed for everything you've sent in for Gordon. He thanks you. And maybe next week we'll do it all again. John Motson is our press conference guest this morning. <laughs> you, can, you, can call, you can call in if you would like. <laughs> Here's the profile. Yeah! Looking worriedly there, looking worriedly to see how the team is doing. Can I just have a go this, John? Yeah, <laughs> Don't often get a chance to do that kind of thing. I'm going live. I'm very glad you're here. Welcome, John Watson, to going live. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. John's our press conference guest today, and he'll be taking lots of questions later on this morning. John, when you start off commentating, <laughs> excuse me, a bit of misbehaving going on. You see, let them loose with Tracy Edwards last week, and they're going mad now with John. Did well, you see all those fish and frogs going over with Tracy Edwards last week? Not what I'm used to, but it's different. It certainly is different, <laughs> that's for sure. When you start off commentating, is it luck? What kind of a match you get to commentate on, first of all, as to how much attention will be drawn to you? Because supposing you, you go, you're commentating on a match which everyone thinks is going to be a predictable score and it turns out to be totally different and suddenly you become a household name because of that don't you well it certainly helped me with that first cup match that i did that you just saw when hereford beat uh, newcastle because i went to that game everybody thought it would be an easy victory for newcastle and they'd show about five minutes on match of the day in the evening and it turned out to be one of the great games of the decade so yes you're very much in the hands of, of what happens during the in, in the match i mean uh, it's spontaneous, really. It's a little bit like your show. You don't know what's going to happen next, because uh, <laughs> if uh, every game was just e easily forecast, then all, clearly there wouldn't be any need to have a commentator, because you're there to react to what, to what occurs. And uh, some games are better than others, obviously. And in a way, the better the game, the easier it is to commentate on, I would say. I mean, how, how do you practice? to be a commentator. Well, you don't really. I mean, people say, write to me and say, how do I become a football commentator or how do I become a sports presenter or whatever? And uh, there's no school to go to or anything like that. You, most of us came up through newspaper reporting and radio and you've learned the job as you've gone along. And the only way you get better is by doing it, really. Is radio more difficult than television commentary, you uh, think? No, I would say, um, from my experience, radio is easier because no one's got a picture, have they? You know, I mean, they can't see whether you're telling them the truth or not. Um, I'm, I mean, it's a half serious. No, you, you can, you, on radio you can describe everything because there's no one, no one's got another dimension. Whereas you go on to television. I remember when I did my first television commentary, having done radio, and the teams kicked off, and I thought, what do I say now? Because everybody had a picture, and all the things that I used to tell them about were there for them to see. So television, you've got to be a little bit more. Um, aware of the fact you've got to add to the picture if you can interpret it a little not, bit not you know? tell people things they can see Absolutely. That are, that, that not straight the obvious. obvious that's right yeah so I, supposing i was going to try and commentate on something this morning like the knitting I, for example yes yeah. supposing i was going to try and commentate on gwen i mean it, there she is now we can see her yeah. on our monitor over there we can indeed um sh she's appearing and i think well here we are we have gwen 
Gwen Matthewman, she's 63 year old grandmother. Is this, am I doing well now? And she is knitting the back half, the back section of Philip's jumper. She has held the record uh, as being the world's fastest knitter for the last 25 years. Um, she's been in the Guinness Book of Records. It's, like, it's very difficult just to keep talking non-stop. You're doing very well. I think you should could keep you, No, but could you sort of do it? Well, we want, we want to know a little bit more about you. you know, has she done this before? How long has she been doing it? You know, what's her background? Uh, what's she going to do after she's finished? You, know, you want a bit of detail? But what about if you, it's all you could see where her hand's going? Clackety clack, clackety clack with the, with the knitting needles. Well, Would you, you know, just... you'd, you'd have to sort of build up the excitement and say, is she going to finish in time? And how long is it going to take her? And will she beat the record? And just sort of try and kind of, you know, make you it see, exciting. You see, you've got me excited about this already, John. Well, I don't know. You I don't, see, I don't, there I don't, we are. I don't that's do knitting that, very often, that, Sarah. That, 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 that's the secret of a, of a brilliant commentator. You build you up the excitement straight away. <laughs> How do you keep all those facts in your head? I don't know, really. All the time. I mean, you, you seem to be able to draw on this yeah. tremendous fund of knowledge. Do you have all the encyclopedia stuck, in, stuck no, up in front no, of you, or does really. it all in your brain? Uh, well, I'm interested in it anyway, and I've been a fan over a number of years, and um, a lot of it you just retain. It's, it's part of the fun of it, basically. I mean, uh, you can look things up in books, and occasionally you need to, but uh, by and large, it's what you're living with every day of your life. It's... Um, it's, a, it's an obsession, really. Now, you've got a competition this morning. You've got yes. some prizes in front. Let's take a look at these prizes first Okay, of all. well, here we have... Um, this is... We can advertise this because it's BBC. You oh, see, it's you're brilliant. allowed to, This is yes. Match of the Day. There's three videos here. We've just done a series. Match of the Day is 25 years old this season, and we've done a series here. There's three decades. The highlights are the 60s, the 70s, and you've got the 80s there, which has just come out, actually, just before Christmas. So these are the, the whole history. All the best bits of Match of the Day over 25 years are on those three videos. OK, what's your question? Well, I thought I'd ask a question about Gaza, because everybody loves Gaza, don't they? He's our star. Yes. You know Gaza, do you? Yeah. You've heard of him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard or, of him. Or yeah, do you prefer yeah. Gary Lineker, yeah. from what I've been told? Well, no, he's just, just friendly, Gary, isn't All he? Right, yeah. fine. No, well, Gaza, you know, is the kid's favourite. And oh. in, the, in the World Cup, as you know, he captured the hearts of all the nation because he, he cried, didn't he? He did. He time. cried. And the reason he cried was Nessun because... Nessun Gaza, we heard yeah, him. That's see. right, yeah. And the reason <laughs> yeah. Gaza cried was because he just had his sort of second yellow card, as they called it, and he wouldn't have played if England had got to the final. So the question is, he just fouled a player, you see, an opponent. So the question is, who was the player that he fouled? Who was the player that Gaza fouled when he burst into tears that that's time right, during the, the World Cup? Answer on a postcard, please, to going live. BBC Television, London, W12, 7RJ. Remember, get those calls in to John Motson this morning for the press conference on 081 811 8181. Thanks for the moment, John. All right, Sarah. Now, Phil's got some prizes to pick with Chris Isaac, so that should be a laugh. <laughs> we go. They're all in the uh, baskets full of oranges. Of course, it's uh, Nell Gwynne's birthday today. Uh, she was the uh, mistress of, uh, of uh, Charles II, apparently. That's what we are. Anyway, she sold oranges, and that's, that's why they're in here. Would you like to dig in there, first of all? We'll do the Jonathan King Prize, first of all. Where's uh, the... Where's that Gordon the Gopher? He's uh, just had a bath, actually. He's, he's just drying himself down, sitting in front of the fire. Just I just don't, I mean, he's not I, in there. You're I don't <laughs> want to have a rabies shot or anything. <laughs> no, he bit me at the end of that as well, which was very unlike him. Just pull in and pull one out just of here. Just drag one out of there. The uh, question was, which group won the best video award in the Brits last year? Uh, the answer was The Cure and Lullaby. Who's won that? Peter Austin. And he's from... Boreham Wood. Boreham Wood. Boreham Wood in Hertfordshire. You've won this. Congratulations. You got the uh, Brits 1991 jacket, the video, and the T-shirts. Right, moving along now to uh, this basket here. This is the um, oh yes, video karaoke. Now there was a there was an item. The question was: Sushi is a type of Japanese food. What is it? What is sushi? Part dog meat, part dream. Yeah, is that the answer? That's like, absolutely correct. Okay. okay, and it's uh, Charlotte Jeffrey from uh, Kent. Yep, Seven Oaks. And of course, the real answer is raw fish. Raw fish being they the real answer. Done. Well done, you've won this. And it is, of course, the entire video karaoke machine. You get the microphones and you get all the tapes as well. But you will need your own television and you will need your own video as well, of course. And you will need something of a voice. Although that's not necessarily strictly true if you were watching last week. And um, you've already picked one out of there, w which is going in. I've just taken a few addresses for later. Yeah, I understand that. That's that's fine. Any any help we can give. Um, if you um, if you'd like to get ready with the answer to that okay. one, we stopped. Said Tracy Edwards. We stopped at five different countries on the round rip red round the world race. What were they? Excluding the start and finish countries. When in fact they went to Uruguay twice. That's the tricky one. Uruguay twice. Australia, New Zealand, and the USA. Who's won that one? I got it all right. Uh, this is. Uh... Punta del Este, Uruguay, 
Fremantle. Fremantle, Australia, Auckland, New Zealand. Wait a sec, Punta del Este. I guess they were twice, huh? Mm-hmm. Uruguay. I guess they were twice, too. Yeah, they did go twice, yeah. Fort Lauderdale, the United States. And that's uh, Lucy and Hannah Johnson. Lucy and Hannah Johnson, well done. Congratulations. Your prize is this. And you have won two T-shirts, a book, video, a plastic fish in a bucket. And don't say we don't provide you with the very best prizes. Now then, we move on just finally here to the Whitney Houston competition. And uh, we asked you... Somebody's going to win Whitney Houston? Yeah, for... <laughs> get Whitney Houston for, for the whole of her tour while she's right. over here, which is weird. doesn't give away anything away here. Uh, Whitney's quite happy about it. We said we would give you uh, tickets to her concert if you didn't actually get Whitney, tickets to the concert if you came up with an original question that you could ask her. So uh, three winners. These three people will be going. We've picked these out already. Three people will be going to see Whitney Houston in concert. Would you like to... Uh, I'll read the names, you read the question, right? So congratulations right. to Nina Jackson, who's in Braintree in Essex. There's the question. How would you describe yourself in a Lonely Hearts column? That's your sort of a question, really, isn't it? <laughs> oh, wow. so, yeah, and the next one, uh, this is from uh, Lindsay Ann McDonald, who's in Parkhead in Glasgow. I don't think we can read that on the air. This is pretty filthy, isn't it? <laughs> oh, well, no, it's go not. ahead. It's your show. <laughs> you began your singing career in the church, and how much of your influence on your life did God have on your singing career? There we are. That was, uh, was pretty clean, actually. It was quite a clean one. Yeah, Lindsay Ann McDonald, congratulations to you. And finally, Kate Nightingale, who's in Nottingham. Congratulations to you, and... I read an article <laughs> stating that you only wear your clothes once, and you give them away. Is this true, and why do you do it? And if it is true, could I have some articles? <laughs> I just Piece knew. Pieces of clothing, maybe? I knew that was coming. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, man. For that. It's been, uh, it's been a great pleasure to have you on the program this morning. Good fun. You must come back. Thank you very you much. You must come back. Thank you, Chris. Of course, when you're knitting at 200 miles an hour, it's very difficult to quench your thirst. Uh, Trevor and Simon are actually giving Gwen a hand now. Oh, God, are you a bit thirsty? Oh, it's yeah. us, actually, the singing corner. Oh, it's, more, it's more like the knitting corner, isn't it, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, are you thirsty? Yeah, yeah. Well, where are you going? Like, how are you going to drink some? Quick, get a, get a straw. Oh, she doesn't want some hay. She's not a horse. <laughs> no, no, a straw. Oh, oh let me straw. see that. Oh, <laughs> quick. Oh, oh, here we are. There's a straw. Oh, here we are. Oh, here's some water. Would you like a bit? Yeah. Oh, that's good. I've written a song for you, actually, Gwen. Oh, could you sing it? Yeah. When will I see you again? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. La, 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 la. Oh, is it the turtles? Oh, suit? it is the turtles, I is think. It? Yes, would you like some pizza as well? Oh, hello, oh, hello Chris. No good, guys. Oh. I tried to get your cards on the thing, but they had the camera right on me. I couldn't. Oh, <laughs> never mind. Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles. Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles. Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles. Heroes in a half shell. Turtle power. Ah, ah. Ah, ah. This is the latest craze. You could win. Try and get it in sync. Try and get the right time. You could win some of these moon boots. If you can answer this simple question. Neil Armstrong was the first man on the moon. Who was the second? <laughs> Neil Armstrong was the first. No, it's coming off. Oh, one-legged. <laughs> one-legged. And you're supposed to be looking like that, jumping that high, actually. Right. Answers on the postcard to us. Oh. <laughs> Going live, BBC TV, London W12, 7, RJ. Philip's picking himself up on the stage. The other Philip, Philip Hodson, is with us for Growing Pains. Nice Hello. to see you, nice Philip. Nice to see you, Sam. We've got lots of letters to yeah. get through this morning, very different sorts of letters. I'll start with this one. Dear Philip, I'm 12 years old and very worried about a little boy who lives near to me. He's four years old and lives with his dad. He's always going out and leaving him alone. He never has any money left for food as he smokes a lot. The boy's clothes are always dirty. He sleeps in the same clothes as he wears all day. He has holes in his shoes. He cries a lot and his tummy rumbles out loud. His dad lies so much. What can I do? I really feel sorry for him. Well, I'm really glad your heart is in the right place. And if you're very worried about him, then I think you should talk either to your parents or to a teacher at school that you trust. And if you still feel not enough is done from that, then you could get help to get in touch with an organization like the 
National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, or there's another one called the Church of England's Children's Society. Now, director inquiries on the telephone are very good. If you, if you want to get those phone numbers, you just dial 192 and you can get those addresses. And they will look into it gently, carefully, and in a professional way. I think that I'm really encouraged that you at 12 are bothered about that rather than lots of other things just for yourself. I think that's a very heartwarming letter and thank you for it. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Dear Philip, ever since the Gulf War started I feel so scared all the time and at night I don't want to close my eyes when I go to bed. People talk about the war all the time at school and some of my friends are scared too. I don't really know why I'm scared because I know they can't send the bombs here and I don't know any soldiers who are there but I still feel frightened of something happening to me. Can you explain why I feel so worried? Well, war is always worrying because it changes the world we live in, doesn't it? That everything around you might be affected, you feel, that the television programmes are changed, your favourite programme might get cancelled. The adults get very, very serious and you are having to cope with all the consequences of that in your own life. Maybe even things not so serious, I mean, maybe you haven't got relatives in the Gulf, but maybe your holiday's been cancelled, or maybe somebody you know has lost a job or even gained a job because of the war. So it affects everything around us, or can do, can't it? It also is difficult if you're at the stage when the future is for you a problem in any case, because, I mean, I know roughly what my future's going to be, because I'm a certain age, but when you're growing up, you worry about the future a lot, and this doesn't help you to cope, it actually adds to the burden in that sense. I think the best way to cope with these worries is to talk to helpful adults and make sure that your questions about the war are answered. Because this, we can all be frightened by our imaginations. I can imagine things, and if I never meet anybody, never see anybody, never talk to anybody, in the end, my mind will frighten me. Whereas, if I know what the risks of life are, I can try and cope with them. Just as, and it's not the same sort of example, just as we all know the roads are very dangerous, but we can live with that fear and that risk and we don't panic about it. And so we can get courage and confidence. I'll tell you a very small story. A four-year-old girl that I know said to her mummy, Mummy, there's, there's a war in your handbag. What? They'd been through a security check and the person doing the check had said, it's because of the war. Now, a four-year-old girl had never heard the word war before, and she didn't know what it meant. She needed to talk, and I'm sure you do too. I think what can also make things more worrying when you're just not used to this situation is perhaps hearing uh, the way we hear about the war through radio, through television, by reading about it, it can sound, as it should, very dispassionate. And the people at the other end, sometimes they sound very worried, but sometimes they don't. And they're talking about very serious things, sometimes very tragic things, without sounding serious. Meanwhile, your response is going to be very, very excited or sad or frightened. We're all more alert, more nervous, more anxious. But what you notice about the reporters is that they can cope with this because they actually talk amongst themselves about the risks. So don't think it's silly to be frightened. But at the same time, don't think that you can't get the courage to deal with the situation that we're all going to have to find. In fact, next week we have as our press conference guest John Simpson oh. coming in. So there's an ideal opportunity to talk about things and ask him the someone sort of questions who, that are worrying you. Someone who was in Baghdad exactly. when the bombs were coming down. Exactly. Um, let's go to our third letter now. Please could you help me? I'm petrified of feathers. Sometimes pe people chase me with one and I feel a little shiver inside me. Everyone tells me a feather isn't alive and they think I'm silly. Is there anything I can do to help myself? Yes, well, look, it's not stupid. Obviously a feather can't hurt you. It's not powerful enough. But what your mind can do with a feather, continuing my point before, can make your nerves really feel very nasty indeed. And that's not silly, those distresses are real. But there's a way through this. If you could start to say, if it matters to me, I'll deal with this. First of all, I'll draw a feather. I'm not very good at drawing, but uh, I'll draw a feather. And I'll look at it. I'll get to know feathers. Maybe I'll cut a feather out and maybe I'll just rub it on my arm. And what I'll notice is that what has bothered me is, is the tickling, the prickling. But if I actually calm my mind whilst I'm doing it and keep breathing regularly and slowly, in the end I can bear it. In the end, you can, it's very hard to tickle yourself, you see. Maybe you'll get a real feather if you can find one on a piece of open ground somewhere. 
then you'll have a great sense of achievement because you'll conquer this and people won't be able to tease you about it anymore. But just a word of warning, people can always find something else to tease you about. There's no answer to teasing except that it's going to happen and we better face up to it in the end. OK? Good luck. Time for one more letter, Philip. Dear Going Live, I'm 14 and adopted. For the first two years of my life, I was in an orphanage in the north of England. I don't know much about my real parents, only that I was in hospital because there was something wrong with me. I think about my real mother a lot, especially at birthdays and Christmas. I wonder if she thinks about me. I don't like to talk to my parents because it upsets them. They say I can find them when I'm older. I want to do this, but I'm scared of what I might find out. Please, can you tell me more about this subject? Well, when you're 18, you have the right to get hold of a copy of your original birth certificate. And that will have the name of your real mum and your registered dad. And then that gives you the opportunity to trace them. So there is that hope for the future. What about now? Of course you think about them. Of course you'd like to find them. And of course you're scared about what you will find. I think that adoption has all sorts of difficulties. I'm not saying everybody who is adopted ends up with problems. But as you're going through being 14 and 15 and 16 and coping with who you are, you will inevitably ask questions and it's very difficult to get answers yet. I hope there's someone you can talk to. Maybe you're not actually giving your adoptive parents enough credit. Maybe they could talk a bit more about this. But if not, somebody at school, an aunt, an uncle, someone around, and you could actually voice these worries and these anxieties. When 18 comes, there is an organisation that can help you. It's called NORCAP, N-O-R-C-A-P. They're in the city of Oxford. Director Inquiries on the telephone, again, can give you that particular telephone number. If you want some help with counselling, there is at least one post-adoption counselling service. That's based in London. But NORCAP can give you that kind of information. I would say to you that there are people of 14 who are not adopted who have lots of problems as well. So don't necessarily think all your problems are about this. And don't make it an excuse, if you like, not to talk about your general anxieties and worries and day-to-day -day difficulties. And go well. Thank you very much, Philip. Of course, when you ring up director inquiries, they don't often give you addresses. You get the phone numbers from them, and then you can ring up and get the address from the, from the people themselves. I think you were yeah. talking about the, the NSPCC earlier You can on. ask for the address as well, but now they're computerised, they're very helpful. Yes, really we've are. just had a call from an operator to say they won't oh. give out addresses, so well, they I was did just... To me, they I did was, to me the other day. I was just, just throwing that one in there. They may, you might get lucky, but uh, I, don't think, I don't think they're officially meant to. Philip, thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you again. I'll get rid of my cold. In about a month's time. Hope you feel better, mm. Sue. Thanks for struggling in this morning. Nice to see you. Now, if you've got a problem you'd like to talk to, then please write to us straight away. Write to us at Growing Pains, Going Live, BBC TV, London W12, 7RJ. This video you can hear in the background is the winner of last year's Brit Award, and it's The Cure. This is it here. It was voted by Going Live viewers as the best. In a moment, we're going to show you ten more nominations for you to vote for. Did you grab a hold? of this copy of number one magazine there inside if you have a check you will see that they are all listed right down here all ten now we do it by phone what i'm going to do is we'll show you the ten videos and each one will carry a number numbers one to ten now if you write down not necessarily your favorite this is the one that you think is just an excellent video write down the one that you think should win and i'll tell you how to vote afterwards here are the ten There you are. Those are the ten nominations for Best Video for the Brit Awards, which we would like you to vote for. Remember, you're not voting for your favourite band here. You're voting for the best video of those ten. And this is how you do it. Have a look at this number on the bottom here. Here's a number. Right, so write that down first of all. 0898 2347. Write that down, because you'll need that first of all. So it's 0898 2347. Give you a couple of secs to scribble it down. 0898-2347, got that. Now then, what you do is you write the number of the video that you want to win after that. So, it, for instance, if it's number one, you'd put 01 after it. So you put that number you've just written down, and then 01. 02, if you're voting for George Michael, then it goes 03, 04. So it's quite simple, right the way down to the bottom. If you're voting for number 10, seal, then it would be 10, number 10. 
So it's that full number that I gave you before, and then the number of the video that you wrote down as your favourite after it. And don't forget, if it's if it's like number four, it will need an O in front of it. Number three will need an O. So there you go, the best of luck. Call those numbers now. By now you should have built up the number of the video you want to vote for, and you'll find out who has won in the Brit Awards. They're on the 11th of February, it's on BBC One, and it's at 7.30. The lines today are open until 1.30, and the call will cost you five pence. So get voting, and we'll find out who's won on the 11th. I think it's time for a bit of a haircut with Ken and Eddie Kennedy. Oh, hello. <laughs> hello, we're barbers. Ken and Eddie Kennedy, the barbers. Oh, I can't find them, Ken. Oh, sorry there's a bit of a mess around, but, uh, well, you see, Eddie's lost something. <clears throat> well, there must be here somewhere. Oh, well, I won't say it too loud, you see, but, uh, well, Eddie's teeth, they're, um, well, they're not his own, if oh. you see what I mean. What, what are you saying there, Ken? Uh, nothing, Eddie, nothing. See, Eddie's had a bit of that flu that's been going around, and, well, just a minute ago, he gave a great big cough and his, his bottom set flew out into, into the hair cupboard, you see. Oh, I found them. Oh, oh. Oh, 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 oh that's, that's good, oh. isn't it, Eddie? You pop them back in then, Eddie. Is that, is that better? Oh, 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 oh yes, oh, oh. Oh, good. oh, that's much better. Oh, hello there. Oh, didn't realise you were here. I've just uh, been looking for something in the hair cupboard. Huh? Oh. Yeah. Oh. Ah, it's a good job we didn't have any customers, eh, Ken? Yeah, well, we never do, do we, Eddie? No, none at all. Still, I'll sweep up this hair anyway, in case we do get the odd customer. Oh, you yes. never know. You, you know, I do think we will have a customer today. Oh, really, Eddie? What oh, makes yeah. you say that? Well, well, I, I don't really know. I just sort of have a feeling in my water. Oh, good. Good. Yeah, That's good. There's definitely a customer coming in today, yes, yes. Oh. Anyway, listen, I've just got to pop out. Could you look after the shop? Because I've just got to nip out and get something for my lunch. Oh, you love.